And I never thought I'd get to the point where I was talking about the geometry of the universe, but here I am. <laughs> I wouldn't ever also, too, ever also, too, that seems slightly grammatically incorrect, um, make presumptions about this if I wasn't, like, way beyond 100% certain. But absolutely everything in nature says it to be the case. I've actually been in a couple of hurricanes. I've seen a few tornadoes. And most people, of course, recognize uh, the cyclonic action of a tornado or a hurricane. But there's upper atmospheric divergence and lower atmospheric e ground level, um, excuse me, upper atmospheric uh, convergence, lower atmospheric uh, divergence. And it too can be reversed depending on weather phenomena. And the center of a hurricane, I've actually been in the center of a hurricane in uh, Daytona Beach, and it's just so beautifully calm and clear and still. Yeah, the eye of the hurricane. We've all seen the eye of the hurricane in pictures, but most of us, of course, have not been in the eye of a hurricane. But Mother Nature is just really simple. I keep kind of humorously referring to her as a chick with uh, muddy feet and dreadlocks and hairy pits and a hemp skirt, and that's kind of accurate. And everything is force in motion, everything is inertia and acceleration, everything is uh, divergence and convergence, and the conjugate geometry of the universe is really simple. And uh, the conjugate geometry, by the way, between the magnetic and the dielectric, because magnetism is the dielectric field, it's like saying ice is the field of water under low temperature, you know, kind of a perfect analogy. Magnetism is a dielectric field. These two conjugate geometries, of course, are the hyperboloid or the hourglass shape, respectively, and uh, the toroid of magnetism. People love to talk about vortexes, though. I love to talk about the vortex mathematics. This I mean, people love to say. Like people talk about the golden ratio. I say, well, do you know what a vortex is? Well, yeah, it's like a funnel. Everybody loves a vortex, and it really everybody does love a vortex. But instead of descriptions and the fact that they're beautiful and fascinating. What about explaining what a vortex is so simply that even a child could understand it? Because we all pulled the drain on the bathtub or the sink and watched the little vortex form. Yeah, of course it goes down the drain. Vortex is just a half a torus. A torus, of course, would be like a donut shape. Well, we only recognize the one end of the vortex because the vortex terminates since we're talking about centripetal convergence, but the end of the vortex also, too, is centrifugal divergence. But people usually don't recognize, um, like in the case of cyclonic or hurricane activity, upper atmosphere convergence, lower atmospheric divergence. We recognize the eye of the hurricane, like the center of a tornado, which I've not been in, but it's incredibly small. So that vortex actually comes down. We're looking at simplex pressure mediation. What would the eye of the hurricane be? The center of the plane of inertia is just a null point. The center of the hurricane is the center of the plane of inertia. Everything in nature, including spiral arm galaxies and everything else, so we'd have, uh, it's kind of not drawn perfectly here, we have this plane of inertia where basically everything exists, like in the case of a spiral arm galaxy. And right at the center, there's that hole, yeah? You've seen this too on the countless thousands <laughs> of ferrocellite you supercell videos that I've made. There's a big black hole on the center of uh, either magnet. And underneath the magnetic viewing film, you can actually see the plane of inertia. You take a big magnet and you put it behind this, you'll see a white line right at the center. Of course, not that you could slice neodymium iron boron or ferrite because they're ceramic and brittle, but if you could slice them like salami, each new half would have a new plane of inertia because there's nothing located there. And this gets into having the near-perfect analogy for incommensurability. The Greeks had three words for this that are basically untranslatable, eoristos dias, tolma, and ananke. Interestingly about that hole, just like the center of a hurricane, where we actually have perfect peace, yeah? Center of a magnet, that plane of inertia. What about the dead center of the center of a magnet? We see the same thing, whether a magnet is solid or not, because the field geometry is unchanged. I don't have, well, I have one right over there, but... A donut shaped or a ring magnet. You put it underneath the ferrocell, yeah, you see the exact same field geometry of the torus and the hyperboloid and a little black spot right at the center. The reason is 
is that respective of the shape of the magnet, this is so important, no one's ever talked about this in any YouTube video or any article either, respective of the shape of that magnet, the field geometry between the conjugate geometry of the magnetic and the dielectric, respectively the torus and the hyperboloid, which by the way also too are the inverse image of one another. Negative image of a hyperboloid is a torus. Negative image of a torus is a hyperboloid. Remains the same. Now, superficially, if I were to take a ring magnet, I'm sorry I don't have one right here, they're right over there. And say, you know, I'm going to put this block magnet underneath the ferro cell. And someone say, yeah, I've seen the ferro cell image before. Yeah. What about this ring magnet, the center of which where there's nothing there, except the field, of course. Am I going to see something different? Or, well, sure you are, because this magnet is a circle. There's nothing in the middle of it, just air. You could stick your finger in it and uh, wear it like a ring. This would be called, called a ring magnet. No, it's exactly identical, because the magnetic field remains unchanged respectively, once again, the torus and the hyperboloid. Everything from physics and metaphysics follows the simplicity. Now, the crosshatch pattern in the center, as you can see, is the hourglass shape. Superimposed on top of that is, of course, the torus. The plane of inertia that which fascinates people so much, of course, would be right here. In explaining the plane of inertia, people love, just like they like talking about vortexes and, uh, and uh, the golden ratio, they love talking about plane of inertia. A lot of people talk about it. We'll ex try to explain it. Because now we have the plane of inertia right here. Well, what is the plane of inertia? Plane of inertia is the rest geometry between the conjugate respective fields of magnetism and dielectricity. Because everything in Mother Nature is not governed by math or even arithmetic, but by pressure mediation. The lowest null point for something to exist between, I say, the fighting fields, because magnetism is a dielectric field. Magnet uh, magnetic field, of course, is uh, toroidal, and the dielectric field is hyperbolic. Well, what's the lowest null pressure point? And the lowest null pressure point between, like, fighting waters, where water is churning up, and it's like fighting the incoming water versus the outgoing water, in, in cases we have these little eddy currents, where actually little things you know, spin up and they're actually at rest between the fighting. Well, that's the rest point between the two competing fields that are interlacing each other between constructive and destructive interference. This place, which is where most life lives, same as our, uh, our uh, spiral arm galaxy, this little place right here, why is it there? Between the centrifugal divergence of the torus and the centripetal convergence of the hyperboloid, yeah, we have two competing fields interlacing constructive and destructive interference. The lowest null pressure point or rest point is right here at the plane of inertia. That's all the plane of inertia is. It's the rest geometry between the conjugate fields. And right here at the dead center, where it is absolute rest, yeah, I'm going to actually erase the chalk there. Yeah, right here. Kind of like your belly button, kind of like the womb. Because the mind, the head is a cavity too. And we got a brain in the cavity in our head, so it's still a cavity. <sighs> still a cavity there. Yeah, right here, right at the dead center, between the overlap, which is the same as this, the hole right there, like the hole in the center of a donut. Yeah, there's a reason why there's a hole there. It's the rest point or null point between centripetal, uh, centrifugal divergence and centripetal convergence. It's the null point between all conjugate field activity. There is no pressure mediation there at all. It is the null or rest point. This literally is the portal of counter space. Yeah? Everything out here is spatial, centrifugal divergence, centripetal convergence, and the interlacing between the two, or the fight between the two, constructive and destructive interference. Well, right at the center there is the center of the plane of inertia, or the null point between forces, because what's the opposite of force? Wouldn't that be complete and total rest, i.e. pure potential? That would be kind of be like the definition of the ether. When you take two magnets, you bring them together, you create one magnet. But if you're able to stick a Gauss meter probe between the two, you'll notice that there's no magnetic flux. It's because as you bring the two magnets together, you have the Gauss meter probe between uh, uh, centrifugal divergence and centripetal convergence, you'll notice there's no magnetic flux. You placed it right at the null point, rest point, between all antinomies. 
the antinomies of the toroidal magnetic and the hyperboloidal dielectric and the force and motion, inertia, and acceleration fight. Fight's not really an appropriate word between the two. A vortex is nothing different than looking at one side of the torus. Yeah. And the vortex, of course, ends at the plane of inertia or at the null point in counter space. At the center of a mass of acceleration, or what human beings unfortunately call gravity, there is no gravity. Yeah, if we had a hole buried to the center of the Earth, there'd be no gravity. Shouldn't the center of something be the highest concentration of something? Just the opposite. At the center of a magnetic flux, there is no magnetic flux. At the center of a mass of gravity that one would accelerate towards, like if you were able to fall to the center of the earth, you would actually start to decelerate and then you'd be floating. Center of gravity, there is no gravity. That tells you basically everything you need to know about gravity too, by the way. Everything in life is like this too. Time is excess, weight is excess, like I have a lot of excess weight. It makes my life more miserable because I have excess weight on my body, right? You know that, I know that. Phenomena. These are all burdens of the spirit. These are all excess. Explaining the plane of inertia and explaining the vortex of uh, nature is incredibly simple, actually. It's that people don't have the proclivity to think simply because Mother Nature is a simple chick. Fields and metaphysics are not two different things. People suffer the greater on the periphery of the torus like a clock. You know, the clock is still turning if I rip the hour hand and the second, the hour hand and the minute hand off that clock, but there's no time at the center of the axle, is there? The further out you go on the hand, the greater the spin, the greater the dizziness, the greater the stress, the greater the misery. People that want more in life, there's a reason why the word for excess is also too a number. It's excisius in Greek. Excessius in Latin, the word in English, is excess. Excess is evil, evil is excess. All forms of metaphysics say this. People try to, you know, he who dies with the most toys wins. The more excess we have, the more miserable life becomes. People are trying to live right out here, just like on the edge of a clock, where the minute hand is moving the fastest. You know, there is a version somewhere, I think in Switzerland, it's a giant clock and the minute hand is like, I don't know, it's something like a thousand yards long, yeah? And it's a genuine clock. And as you, of course, stand near the center, there, you know, you're basically imperceptible movement. Take an hour to, to go around uh, the center of that axle. But the further you go out, the faster it goes, the more dizzying it goes, the, you know, you start to get sick and you want to hurl your cookies. Everything in life is like that. At the periphery, there is misery. At the center, there is rest. There is never rest or happiness or liberation out here in the periphery. The same is true of the conjugate geometry of the universe. Everything within physics and metaphysics, field physics and metaphysics, are not two different things. They're one thing. That specific geometry, that conjugate geometry, makes explaining life simple. It makes explaining liberation simple. It, it makes explaining retroduction simple. People say, I don't get retroduction. I've heard that a million times. Like, what's retroduction? I'll tell you what retroduction is. Really simple. Here we got the plane of inertia. And we have the rest point right here, which we can call liberation. It is going from hya to mya. You want to live out here. Retroduction is just falling inwards to where there is no more stress, no more excess. Excess is evil. Desire for excess. Well, why is there desire for excess? Primordial agnosis. What's the cause of primordial agnosis? Ah, trick question. There is no cause. Primordial agnosis cannot have a cause. Nor could it necessitatively. In all monistic metaphysics, there's no first cause, or original sin. It's completely nonsensical. Everything terminates at the null plane or the plane of inertia. And the center of the plane of inertia is that null point of, we could call it, the court, we call it the portal of counter space, we could say it um, zero point, I don't care what name people call it, you call it Godhead, you can call it the Demiurge, doesn't make any difference. 
to me what people call it. It's completely irrelevant. But there's no rest out here for anybody. We're all traveling on the outside of the Taurus, you know, birth, old age, sickness, and it keeps going on and on and on. People love the roller coaster ride. Smart people, wise people specifically, want off the roller coaster. But most of us don't. So all of this culminates, uh, culminates at the null plane, or the plane of inertia. Explaining the plane of inertia is really simple. It's like, what is the plane of inertia right here between the, you know, right here as against the torus and the hyperboloid? It's the lowest rush point between the two competing fields. It is forced there, but it is itself the opposite of force. Yeah, pressure mediation, say force there as an adjective, but it is itself the opposite of force. Between the magnetic and the... Because all life exists right here at the null point. All life uh, lives here, and of course, going right here towards the center, that would be liberation. That is where no force exists. The center of gravity, there's no gravity. The center of a magnet, there is no magnetic flux. Jeez, kind of sounds like the metaphysics of life. Out here is excess and misery and suffering, and here is rest. But the camel can't pass through the eye of a needle, nor can someone who's addicted to forms, phenomena, wealth, riches, houses, so on and so forth, nor, nor can they suffer to pass to the center of the eye of the needle. It's not passing through the eye of the needle, it's passing to the eye of the needle, not through it. Through it would just be going to the other side. So that uh, old saying from the Bible is wrong. True metaphysics would not be passing through the eye of the needle, which would just be going from one misery to the uh, antinomy uh, of miseries, which would be uh, bliss, as the old Pali saying, adukum asukum, which basically translates metaphysically as neither this side nor that side. It's not passing through the eye of the needle, but to the eye of the needle, where nothing is. The opposite of phenomena, the opposite of everything. This is where we get all the symbolism of the spindle whirl. We all get the symbolism of threading the needle. There's a lot of metaphysical symbolism about threading the needle. I hope I made that clear. Um, I understand physics and metaphysics inherently as their connectivity extremely well. I don't think most people think about stuff like that. Maybe some people just don't care. Either way, I hope you like this video. If you do, send me a uh, an email if you have any questions. Uh, check out my description with my email below. Any donations always warmly welcome. I hope you have a wonderful day and uh, lux veritas.